Revelation chapter 17, where we see the vision of the scarlet woman riding a scarlet beast. And the name of the woman is the mother of harlots. And we see in Revelation 17 the fall of Babylon portrayed in a particular way, before in 18 the fall of Babylon is portrayed in another way. Let me explain. Babylon, as we've already seen in these studies in Revelation, represents all that is opposed to God. Where does the word Babylon come from? It comes from the word Babel. After the flood, God had commanded humanity to spread out across the earth and refill the nations of the world. But instead of obeying God, in a spirit of rebellion, they founded a city called Babel. And there was a tower, like a, an ancient type of skyscraper. They wanted it to reach to the heavens. That uh, perhaps they thought they'd make it high enough so if there was another flood, uh, they could escape it without God's help. I don't know the details, but I know what Babylon stands for. Rebellion. Sinful. Self-will. And it will be in judgment on the spirit of rebellion in all its manifestations that the destruction known as the fall of Babylon will come. Now there are, most commentators would say there are two expressions, two manifestations of the spirit of rebellion called here Babylon in the book of Revelation. There is the financial and commercial centre, if you like, the political centre of human government. And that's destroyed in chapter 18. But here in chapter 17, we have the religious manifestation of all that is opposed to God. After all, ever since there's been true religion on earth, there's been false religion. Ever since men and women have looked upward and worshipped God, they've also looked elsewhere, and even sometimes inward, to worship other gods for themselves. Not only that, throughout history, true believers have always been persecuted by those with a religious agenda. Think of the Lord Jesus Christ himself. It was the Sadducees and Pharisees that plotted to crucify our Lord. They persecuted Peter, John and the other apostles. It was with religious zeal that Saul of Tarsus persecuted the church it was jealousy, religiously motivated jealousy, that led the Jews of Asia to stir up trouble for Paul, and so on. We haven't got time to go into such things as the Spanish and various Catholic inquisitions tonight, where men and women, and even children, were tortured and executed for their faith in Christ. In the modern day, we could talk about persecution in Islamic countries, where believers are persecuted there. We could talk about the persecution of Christians in those nations where God is said not to exist. But if atheism and communism are not manifestations of this religious Babylon, I don't know what is. My point being that there is an ideological and a religious background, a motivation behind the persecution of the church. We don't fit in with their worldview. Because we accept God's worldview. There are many commentators who see at the end of time all false religions becoming joined together in some way in their rebellion against God. I don't know if that's true. What I do believe in Revelation 17 is God lumps them all together in this description. And they're all as bad as each other as far as God is concerned. Some people have asked the question, what will be the final end time religion. And can I remind you, there will not be one. And we'll come to that here in Revelation chapter 17. The direct worship of Satan is the final expression of Babylon's evil on earth before Jesus comes again. So let's have a look at the verses in order. Verses 1 and 2. Remember the angels who poured out the seven bowls of God's wrath? Now one of them comes... To show John the judgment prepared for the great harlot who sits on many waters. Now that doesn't mean she lives beside the seaside. Because verse 15 informs us that the waters are meant to represent all the nations and tongues of the earth. This woman dominates people on the face of the earth. 
And she can only do that if she is somehow a, a spiritual entity. The hearts of men and women need to be dominated for this kind of influence to be held. We talk about the spirit of the world. We talk about the spirit of the age, which St. John describes in his first epistle and second epistle as the spirit of Antichrist. Opposed to Christ. That's what that means. The word harlot is generally used in scripture to denote those who reject the true God and turn to falsehoods, idols, regarding them as true. For example, I'll read to you just a one verse of many you could select from Jeremiah. Have you seen what backsliding Israel has done? She has gone up to every high mountain and under every green tree, and there played the harlot. That's Jeremiah's uh, prophecy, God's description of Israel's idolatry. It uh, gets them called harlots. So this scarlet woman is a personification, the epitome of all idolatry. She represents every false religious form, every false religious practice. The reformers would have seen her as the Roman Catholic Church, and she may include the falsehoods of that church, but not exclusively. There are many other falsehoods to be lumped together here. This spirit dominates the nations to this very day. There is a kind of religiousness that people will accept even when they're not prepared to accept God's living and true way through Jesus Christ, the Lord and Saviour. The people of earth, whether they are leaders or followers, are pictured here in verse 2 as submitting themselves, being seduced by the spiritual adultery of this woman. They are intoxicated, made drunk with the wine of her fornication, when it says intoxicated, it means completely taken over. Again, I'll quote to you from Jeremiah. And if you're ever struggling to understand a verse in the Bible, you need to compare it with another part of the Bible. Because the symbolism will often be consistent. Babylon was a golden cup in the Lord's hand that made all the earth drunk. The nations drank her wine. Therefore, <coughs> the nations are deranged. Jeremiah 51, verse 7. How are they so taken over as if they are intoxicated? It's because behind every false and idolatrous religious practice are demons active in the world today. You see, the false religions of earth are actually part of Satan's kingdom, part of what he does to try and keep men and women blinded to the truth of the gospel and away from the salvation which is in Jesus Christ. Paul had to remind the Corinthian church that the things which the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice to demons and not to God. And I do not want you to have fellowship with demons. In verse 3, the angel carries John away in the spirit to a solitary place. And that's very significant. It happened, of course, in Zechariah where uh, the woman representing iniquity was put in an ephah basket and covered with a lead lid, carried off into the wilderness of Shinar, Babylon, where a place was built for her. You see, the wickedness is a wilderness, a spiritual desert. You will find no water of life in the false religions of the world. You will find no blessing, no real forgiveness for sin, in any other name than the name of Jesus Christ, God's Son. And as I say, in the name of Jesus Christ, uh, we have to understand who Jesus is and what he taught, because there are false religions who will take the name Jesus and attach it to all kinds of crazy nonsense that he never uttered at all. It's true. Jesus Christ is not only the only way, he is the only truth, yeah. and he's the only life. And anything outside of him, friends, is a wilderness. Upon first sight of the harlot, John is struck by the fact that she's riding a scarlet beast. And notice this beast has seven heads and ten horns. We've seen that figure before in Revelation. The beast is the embodiment of blasphemy, as uh, he says here. 
he was full of the names of blasphemy. That means it must be the same beast that rose out of the sea in chapter 13. A worldwide dominion led by Satan, ultimately given into the hands of Antichrist himself. And the vision denotes that the woman will dominate this empire for a time, but only until the Antichrist exerts his power. I say it's a challenging chapter 17, because some of the symbols point to more than one thing. And we must, by the help of God's Spirit and by comparing Scripture with Scripture, make certain deductions about what is going on here in the vision. But what John is taken aback by, in verse 4, is the great wealth of this woman. A wealth of this world's luxuries, denoting sinful pleasures and excess. Her wealth was obtained by unjust means. I've said it before, I'll say it again. I wonder what's happening in the world when millions and billions are given to certain projects and there are religious groups and churches, even in our own country, who are sitting on millions of pounds and yet the poor are getting poorer throughout the world, the starving are starving and I won't just highlight those practical issues. People are dying and going to hell without Jesus Christ because there is no investment in mission no investment in churches, in ministry, in evangelists. People who are called by God have to leave their call and go and get a job instead because they can't afford to eat. And this is happening in our country. It's happening across the Western world. It's happening in impoverished countries too. Where is the investment in God's kingdom? God has given us what we have that we might use it for his kingdom. Yeah, do you remember that parable Jesus told? He, and he, he, he said uh, about the parable of the unjust steward. It wasn't even his own money he was spending. But he spent it to make friends. And after telling this little story, Jesus said, I'm telling you this, use worldly wealth to make friends for yourselves. That after it is gone, they may welcome you into heavenly dwellings. So what's our wealth for if we have any wealth? What Jesus said is to make sure we've got plenty of friends up there. Get them saved. The mission is first, not second. Don't look at nine tenths of your pay packet and say, oh, the other tenth is for God. If you're someone who believes in tithing, and if you've been brought up in a Pentecostal church, you're bound to. That ten percent is first. Your first consideration, your first thought, what you give to God is always the first thought in your mind. The first fruits of your increase given to the Lord. Not only tithes, that's the least you could give. Offerings as well. Christians who preach against tithing should be slapped across the mouth. It's the reason the church in this country is in such a mess. Friends, do we really believe in the kingdom come? Do we really want to see souls saved? People say they do. They cry and weep and lift their hands and pray to God. But ask them for money. Hit them where it hurts in the pocket. You won't get a brass farthing out of them. We can't fool God. This woman has all the wealth of the world. It didn't do her any good. It's not doing the world much good either. If she was a real woman and not a, a personification, she can only wear one dress at a time, can't she? There's nothing wrong, ladies, with spending money on yourself. You carry on. As long as God's kingdom is first. Nothing wrong in a Christian looking after his or herself and their family. God has blessed you. Hallelujah. Thank God for that. But it brings responsibility to the kingdom and the mission. You see, that's, I'm sure that's why the reformers saw in these verses the Roman Catholic Church, the richest organization on earth. And yet that money locked away in treasures, 
not used to spread the gospel of Christ. It is just money that's rusting. Yeah. Although she might pretend to be holy, we find in verse 5 that she is, well, it's clear for anyone to see who she is. It's tattooed across her forehead. I have read, I'm not sure how true it is, because I'm sure they wouldn't be able to tell, um, but, but Roman prostitutes used to have labels with their names on, painted on their foreheads. That may be true. But the fact that it's such in a prominent place means it's clear for all the world to see. She is a mystery. That's her name, it's got three parts. Mystery. Mystery here is a reference to occult mysticism. The devil worship of idolatry. Oh yes, there's something spiritual in other religions. I remember being in a Roman Catholic service in a school actually. I'd been invited, I went along, they said the Hail Marys, I kept my mouth shut. And as the teachers were praying to Mary, I'm telling you I felt a very powerful spiritual presence. But it was not the spiritual presence I'm used to when I pray to God the Father in the name of His Son, Jesus Christ, it was an entirely different presence. But it was real. It was there. Whoever it was. It wasn't God. Mystery. Occult mysticism. Sadly, there are still Christian churches bound by this kind of occult mysticism. They talk about the mysteries. Some things are reserved only for the priesthood. That kind of mystery. Thank God there's nothing like that in the Bible. Thank God for a straight speak, speaking saviour. Yeah. He says, whatever I've whispered in your ear, he said this to the apostles, whatever I've whispered to your ear in the inner rooms, proclaim it from the housetops. Don't keep it to yourself. There's no priestly ministry here. That mystery here, sorry. It's for everyone to share the gospel and understand the truths of the word. That's why we're called to minister. That's why we're called to serve. There should be nothing mystic left about the Christian religion. And those things that are mystic need to go. This evil woman is called mystery. Babylon the Great, symbolically the source of all commerce, politics and religion, which is anti-God. Remember that's what Babylon means, it's anti-God. The mother of harlots and abominations. Any evil you can imagine, she's already imagined it. This is the collective evil of the sinful hearts of men and women, represented together with the evil spirits that influence them, all put together in one symbol. Babylon, the great, the mother of harlots. She is drunken with the blood of the followers of Jesus Christ. Her drunken state implies her demonic pleasure that she takes in their suffering and death. But it also signifies her sin was full and ready for judgment. John is filled with horror. He said, I marvel with great amazement. He means he was horrified at the fact that this woman was responsible for the death of the saints. And as I said at the beginning, it's been true throughout history. Christians have been murdered mostly by religious people. Yeah. False religion is still the most powerful evil in the world today. In verses 7 and 8, the angel comes to give John an understanding about what the vision of the woman riding on the beast means. And while we're grateful for the amount of understanding we can get out of it, even if there's a lot that we perhaps cannot understand or explain, there are things that we can we can certainly be aware that this great evil is influencing our world today. But we see the beast connected with that in chapter 13. And remember that there it signified both the Antichrist and his brief kingdom. That kingdom is a worldwide dominion. And of course it doesn't rise from nowhere. There are such kingdoms in the world throughout history. The Antichrist himself will apparently, underline apparently, because it isn't true, but it will appear to the whole world that he has died and risen again, to the amazement of all who fail to love the truth 
and whose names are not written in the Lamb's book of life. And the rise of his kingdom will astonish them also. Because uh, it will be so sudden that he shall take over the world. The seemingly invincible beast, however, thank God I've read on a couple of chapters in Revelation, you know, he's going to be captured and thrown into the lake of fire. He's the only person of whom it is clearly said that he will rise out of the abyss before being thrown into the lake of fire. He is the one possessed of Satan because it's Satan who rises out of the abyss to go to his destruction. The kingdom of the beast, the instigator of that kingdom, the devil, are synonymous in the book of Revelation. What happens to one happens to the other. The devil's behind it all. The devil is behind the false religion of the world. The devil is behind the persecution of the saints. The devil is behind what eventually comes in the epitome of what is happening. Imagine it this way, and this is actually how the Bible puts it in 2 Thessalonians. There is an evil work of iniquity. Lawlessness. It's already at work in the world. Hearts of men and women are sinful and fallen. But there is a spiritual kingdom around us led by Satan. Wicked spirits that influence those who are fallen and dead in sin. And that's every unbeliever outside of Christ. And it's already having its way in people's lives. But then St. Paul writes this. When the Holy Spirit, we believe he's talking about, is taken out of the way. The one who is holding back this tide of evil will eventually be taken from the earth. And when he is, and I believe the church with him, there will be nothing to stop the fullness of the manifestation of that evil. So if you're looking at the first readers of the book of Revelation, way back at the end of the first century, did they face this kind of evil influence, this satanic power, this false religion, this persecution? Did they face it? Yes, they did. It was relevant to them that Christ would give them the victory over all this. Is it relevant today? Christians persecuted across the world, particularly at the moment in Islamic and in that one Hindu nation of India. Yes, it applies to believers today. But then we must take a step further to the very end where it will be allowed to have its absolute way. And that's what we're seeing unfolding in these chapters. Evil men and seducers going from bad to worse until the ultimate evil is unleashed. And it's at that time God will intervene. The verses we're told require some wisdom to interpret in verse 9. The seven heads of the beast represent seven hills on which the mountain sits. First thing that comes to your mind if you're a student of history, ah, I wonder if that's wrong. And many accept that. Her influence is worldwide and spiritual, but it seems she has a headquarters in a literal city. People take it to be Rome, and of course the reformers thought, oh, this is all about the Catholics, so it must be the Pope in Rome. But not necessarily so. The Antichrist certainly is not the Pope, and he is not a Pope. But there are many other cities on seven hills. Mecca, for instance. Israel's got Jerusalem, that's built on seven hills. Well, they're hard to describe anymore. And we've already identified Jerusalem as the headquarters of the Antichrist. And in the final verse we see the woman represents the city that rules the world. At John's time that was certainly Rome. By the time of the end it will be Jerusalem. You remember of course that the original Babylon was built on a plain, not on hills. So whatever the identity of this city, wherever uh, the full manifestation of this anti-God power sets up his throne, that's where judgment will be visited on him and that's where his throne will be destroyed. But these seven heads have another, a dual meaning, verses 10 and 11. As well as the seven hills of a city, they represent seven kingdoms or empires. Seven kings, it says, more likely to be kingdoms. Five have fallen. One is still in existence. I find it interesting to 
look back at Daniel's visions of beasts. When beasts rose out of the sea in the visions of Daniel, they represented kingdoms that ruled the world. We've said this before, okay? So the first beast was Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, conquering the whole known world at the time, ruling over them all. The next beast was Persia. But what is specific about these beasts, remember Daniel, is a Jew in exile. And it's not so much that Babylon ruled over the whole world, they ruled over Jerusalem and the world. It mattered to the Jews. Then the Persians came. They were the next great Gentile empire to rule in Jerusalem. Then comes Alexander the Great and the Greek Empire is another world, the known world. Much of it was ruled by the Greeks, but they specifically ruled in Jerusalem. That's why, uh, by Jesus' time, much of Israel was Greek. Greek speaking, Greek um, writing everywhere. It was a very bilingual place in Jesus' time. Then, of course, comes the Romans. The Romans who loved Greece and everything Greek. They trampled and destroyed everywhere they went. They ruled uh, by uh, that kind of merciless violence. Some have thought that the fact that not only... We've already been told that the Antichrist, he apparently dies and rises again in a parody of Christ's death and resurrection. But some believe that the kingdom of the beast represents a resurrection of a previous world power. And that makes sense for one reason. You see, these previous world powers were generally led by one man, Nebuchadnezzar Babylon. Uh, kings such as uh, Darius in Persia, the Medo-Persian kingdom. Alexander, ruling Greece. Rome had many Caesars, and most of them, not all, but most of them, were despots. This Antichrist, this man who will briefly rule the world, is that kind of despot. Some see his kingdom to be a revived version of the Roman Empire, because it will be a worldwide empire. And the Antichrist rules the world until his kingdom is ended by the return of Jesus Christ. Remember how in Daniel's vision, another vision of the statue, talking about those same kingdoms. You have the head of gold, which was Nebuchadnezzar, the shoulders here of silver, which represented the Persians. Then you have the mid part uh, of bronze, which was Greece, going down to the iron of the legs, which is Rome. And then at the very end of time, you have a mixture of the iron and the clay. And uh, one notable king arises to rule at that time. And then the stone cut with that human hand strikes the feet of the statue and ends all earthly dominion as Christ sets up his kingdom on earth. And when we're looking at the kingdom of the beast, we're right down there with toes. Because the beast has ten underlings that rule with him for a time. And this is the last worldwide kingdom to be destroyed by the return of of Jesus Christ. We've already noticed that Antichrist will give his authority to ten regions. Look at verses 12 and 13. The ten horns which you saw, I'm comparing them with the ten toes in Daniel's vision, they are ten kings who have received no kingdom as yet, but they receive authority for one hour as kings with the beast. They are of one mind and will give their power and authority to the beast. Those verses tell me, you've got to do a bit of deduction here, they've received no kingdom as yet, which means they're not world leaders. Don't, don't imagine the United Nations coming together and saying, oh, look at this amazing man, we'll give power to him. <coughs> Won't happen. Don't imagine the European Union getting together and having a vote and making someone president of Europe and he's the Antichrist. Won't happen. The beast gets his power from Satan directly. There's no vote, there's no discussion, there's no handing over from anyone to him. He's given the rule of the nations. And he appoints ten men on the basis of one fact, they'll do his bidding. 
<coughs> you can see the comparison with some of the Roman Caesars here. Verse 14. These will make war with the Lamb. We've been building up to this, haven't we, through these chapters in Revelation. They've got no way of escaping Jesus Christ coming again, so they're going to actually make war against him. They're going to fight, but they're going to try to. Not a shot will be fired, by the way. That doesn't stop them from fighting against him. And if you think that's a crazy idea, let me just share something with you. I remember, well, it's 30 years ago now, um, summertime 1991, I believe. Might have been 92, must have been 92, sorry. Because I wasn't filled with the Spirit until later in 1991. And I was out, I used to go from church every Sunday night, I go into Pontypool Town, which in those days was quite busy in the night, and I start witnessing to the gangs that were around. Sometimes you would find a bit of trouble, a bit of argy bargy, um, but the police were no friends of mine, so I wouldn't report it, they were too busy trying to arrest me. For things I haven't done, they come and break up your preaching, and so forth. So, you know, the crooks that I was talking to kind of trusted me not to report them to the police. But there was one lad I started sharing about Jesus, and he was obviously on drugs. And he began to climb up his car window. He was so enraged, he didn't even take the time to open the door. He's climbing out the window trying to strangle me, cursing the name of Jesus. Jesus! Jesus! I hate Jesus! And he gets out the window and I'm holding him up. I got him between my shoulders on my back and I'm carrying him. As he's trying to separate my head from my body. This is the anger against Christ. And I'm talking 30 years ago. I'm not talking in some unknown future that we're trying to piece together. This man hated Jesus Christ to such an extent, he was trying to kill me. He didn't know what he was doing. He was high on drugs. And I remember, and it was only the Lord who could give me such gentleness, because otherwise, you know, I'd have chucked him on the floor and kicked him one. But the Lord gave me gentleness, and I knew what to do. I said, in the name of Jesus Christ, come out of this man. And I put the man on his feet. And he looked around, he had no clue where he was. He didn't know what he had just done. Because it wasn't him. It was a demon spirit had taken possession of him. By the way, that always happens if someone takes drugs. Every time. He didn't even know that he'd attacked me. His mates had to tell him they go. So when I say people inspired by demons will try to fight Jesus Christ, literally, it's not as far-fetched as you might think. I still see that chat now, and he still has no recollection. He lives 100 yards from me, says good morning, no recollection of it at all. And I had to cast a demon out of him in Jesus' name. I have prayed for him, God bless him. The Lamb, when he returns, whatever opposition, whatever power is arrayed against him, he will conquer all. For he is the Lord of lords and the King of kings. Nothing can stand before him. And by the way, those who are with him, that's us. We are called and chosen and faithful to him. The victory is his alone. But he shares it with us. So the victory is ours. That's why you're able. You might be a weak Christian like me. But if you're confronted with a devil, you can cast it out in Jesus' name. Because it's his victory. Yeah. I don't even care if you're not much of a man or woman of God. I prefer that you were baptized in the Holy Spirit first, but even if you weren't, you've got the name of Jesus. Mm -hmm. That's enough. It is. As long as you know him, remember those sons of Sheba, they tried to cast out a spirit in the name of Jesus.